Oh, I don't have water. I hear this. Hear this. All right. Well, that's very loud. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we are Left Bank Books, and we are presenting Keith Boykin, who will discuss his fantastic new book, Why Does Everything Have to Be About Race? 25 Arguments That Won't Go Away. He'll be in conversation tonight with Vincent Fluellen from Webster University. Tonight's event is possible only because of your support. When you support us at Left Bank Books, your money goes directly into your local economy. It helps support writers um, and give them the support that they deserve and allows us to produce events such as this. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight for this. We also want to extend a welcome to our virtual audience tonight. Uh, you'll be able to participate in the Q&A session later by leaving your question as a comment. Uh, so my name is Evan, and I will be your host for tonight's event. Um, to um, kind of give a preview of some of our upcoming events, we're really back into the swing of it with the new year, so we've got a lot of new stuff coming up. Um, we are going to be joined next week by Curtis Chin on Two weeks, I've got a lot of events going on. Curtis Chin, um, whose memoir, Everything I Learned, I Learned in a Chinese Restaurant, tells the story of his growing up in Detroit in the 1980s um, in his multi generational family restaurant, where he learned to embrace his identity as a gay American born Chinese man and navigate this divided city spiraling misfortunes. A full calendar of all of our upcoming events is always available on our website. Um, some more names of mentioned coming up are Nadia Korafor, Amy Spalding, and Philip B. Williams. Um, so we have events for every reader of all ages, so be sure to check that out on our website, left-bank.com. For tonight's event, we are delighted to be joined by Keith Boykin. Keith is a New York Times bestselling author, TV and film producer, and former CNN political commentator. Graduate of Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School, Keith served in the White House, co-founded the National Black Justice Coalition, co-hosted the Black Entertainment Television talk show My Two Cents, and taught at the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University in New York. He's a Lambda Literary Award-winning author and the author and editor of seven books, including this new one, Why Does Everything Have to Be About Race? This is a fantastic new book that shows us how to refute the lies, myths, and misinformation with history, knowledge, and truth. A mixture of personal experience, recording, and extensive research, um, Keith takes a wrecking ball to the 25, sorry, to 25 of the most widespread um, deceptions about race. And again, joining us in this conversation tonight is Vincent C. Flellen in of Webster University. Uh, he is the Associate Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer with more than 25 years of experience weaving DEI into the culture of education in the St. Louis area. Uh, he was named the St. Louis Business Journal's 2020 Class of Diverse Business Leaders. In 2019, he was presented the Deluxe Power 100 Award in recognition of this leadership. A proud member of the LGBT community, he serves on several nonprofit boards and civic councils, including the first, city's first ever LGBTQIA plus advisory board uh, at the appointment of St. Louis City Mayor. He's currently a doctoral candidate in Webster University School of Education and holds a master of social work from WashU and a BA in education from Maryville University. So please join me in welcoming both of our fantastic guests, Keith Boykin and Vincent Flowen. Thanks, Evan. Welcome home, Keith. Hey, thank you. This is my hometown. Yeah, so it's good to be here. You know, I spent the day in the rain um, going around to various places of historical significance, uh, personal significance and historical significance, because um, I do these videos online on um, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, uh, where I talk about issues that are going on in our country. And uh, so I went to the courthouse downtown uh, where the Dred Scott decision was decided mm -hmm. back in the 1840s. Uh, it was one of the most important Supreme Court decisions uh, for black people, a bad decision. 
And then I went to um, Homer G. Phillips Hospital, which is where I was born. I too was born there. Were you born there too? Yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> you're, I thought you were born at Bar. I didn't know that. I was born at Homer G. Phillips Hospital, and so yeah, I went there. And then um, I went somewhere else. Oh, I went to um, 3012 Vine Grove, which is the address where my mom lived when I was born, and where she was, where her address when she was born. Um, and um, so much history there. I talk about that address a lot in this book, so yeah, it's I, I feel good to be home. Do you also go by um, Shelly Kramer? Um, I did, I went to the Kramer house too, right? Yes, I forgot the uh, not the Kramer, the Shelly house, yeah. the Shelly house, yeah. The Kramers were the ones who tried to stop them right. from buying the house, so I went to the JD Shelley's house too, which is right down the street from the house where I grew up as a young child, where my uh, grandmother lived. And um, I, don't, I never knew about it the whole time I, I was uh, living here back in the day. So I learned about it later on when I was uh, an adult. And this is the home in which um, a, a, a black family tried to purchase, but a white family kept them. Right. There's a house on Labrie Avenue where a black family in the 1940s, uh, J.D. Shelley, uh, tried to purchase the house. He actually did buy the house. Um, and moved in. And the day he moved in, one of the neighbors uh, had a lawsuit uh, filed against him to try to evict him from his own home mm -hmm. because this was a neighborhood that was supposed to be an old white neighborhood. And at that time in the 1940s in St. Louis, there were a lot of racially restrictive covenants. So it wasn't, the law didn't say that you couldn't, um, you know, rent or sell to black people, but the neighbors got together and made their own little agreements and said that we will not allow black people to be in our neighborhoods. And so one of the neighbors broke the rule, broke the agreement, and let this black family move in or buy this place from them. And one of the white neighbors got so upset about it that he took them to court and sued them all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court to stop this black family from living this neighborhood. Uh, and so, you know, it's just astounding, astounding how much effort that people put into perpetuating white supremacy. You know, I think, it, you know, you, why does everything have to be about race? And here you are in St. Louis and talking about your, 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 your visits here. Yeah. Uh, St. Louis years ago, uh, maybe about 10 years or so ago, the Missouri Historical Society hosted an exhibit called uh, Number One in Civil Rights. Uh, and it spoke about uh, the historical civil rights cases that many of which sprung from St. Louis, including um, the, the, the Shelley Kramer uh, versus Kramer case, obviously the Dred Scott case, right. um, so many of those uh, U.S. Supreme Court cases actually sprung from St. Louis that were about issues of race. Yeah, that's true. I didn't know that when I lived here at all. Uh, I also didn't know that the hospital where I was born, Homer G. Phillips Hospital, was named after a famous black lawyer, um, Homer G. Phillips was his name, who was one of the people who represented black people uh, after the, the, the East St. Louis race massacre, where black people were slaughtered in the streets. Uh, and he represented black people who fought back and defended themselves. Um, and that's how the hospital got its name. Yeah, so much history here, so much history. So this book, 25 Arguments That Won't Go, Why Does Everything Have to Be About Race? Um, why the title? Um, Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I was uh, giving a speech a few years ago. Uh, I think it was in upstate New York, can't remember exactly where. I was giving a speech, it was a, a Black History Month speech, and we were talking about diversity and talking about, now it, it was a very inclusive Black History Month speech. I was talking about, about all different kinds of diversity out there. And then at the end of the speech, uh, a grad student, a, a white grad student got up and asked me a question. And he said, you talked about black people a lot, but you know, you didn't really talk about economic issues and economic diversity, which affects a lot of white people. And why, why do you have to make everything about race? And I was like, this is black history month. <laughs> <laughs> Doing a black history month speech. I, I talked about all these other things, so, but the moment you mention race, that becomes, oh my God, why do you have to keep bringing this up, bringing this up? We can talk about anything else, but let's not talk about race. And so it, it's this question that keeps coming up from a lot of people. I, I found that on Twitter, which has become a really hostile place in the past <laughs> um, couple of years since Elon Musk took, Musk took over. But I found on Twitter, a lot of people are always asking me questions like that. 
And Twitter is like the worst place to get the get some of this information. You get these questions over and over from people, like, uh, why do you, I'm going to start getting this? I guess the next month. Why do you need a, a Black History Month? We don't have a White History Month. <laughs> or, you know, those types of questions. It's like, it's just so annoying to have to deal with them. And I wanted to write a book that kind of responded to all those questions that we as Black people and people of color receive all the time and get just get tired of having, having to answer to, from white people um, and and not having to to not having to sort of spend our lives responding to those questions, you know. There's a quote at the beginning of the book from Toni Morrison that I use, uh, and she talks about why racism exists. And she says the function of racism, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you distracted on answering somebody else's questions. You know, what about this? Did, were you really discriminated against? Were they really searching you? Were, were, did they really stop you because you were black? Were they really following you in that department store because you're black? And we, we just spend all, all this time sort of answering these questions over and over again to prove that the existence of something we all know is happening, but other people were invested in denying. We see this even right now, this, this past week with um, Nikki Haley, who is running for president. And she was she just last week said that we have never been a racist country. Now, you know, I think America is a racist country and has always been a racist country. I think it's obvious. And I know there are people who argue today that it's not a racist country because we've had a black president, we have new laws, all these other kinds of things. I get that. But to, uh, to go back and say that we have never been a racist country is just to erase hundreds of years of history of slavery and segregation and Jim Crow and lynchings and, and mass incarceration and discrimination. And, and it's just astounding that somebody can say that and then double down and defend it. I thought she was going to walk it back and apologize. Oh, you know, I made a mistake. I misspoke or something. But she's doubled down and defended it the past several days. It's just astounding. And she's supposed to be the good person. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what we're seeing, you know, with these pushes in terms of history, too, and, and being told and taught in schools. Here locally, um, there, there's a school district further out west that, you know, said we're not teaching black history. Here in, in, in Missouri? In, in, yeah, in St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis County is further out west. Charles. Uh, St. Charles. St. Charles. St. Francis Howell. <laughs> they said, <laughs> and uh, as a result, you know, students, students, students pushed back Good. and said, "No, we want this as a part of our education." Uh, I'm often, uh, and so the school board just met. I think this week, last week, and I think they've kind of walked that back and said they're going to retool the uh, curriculum and then have it available next year for students. Um, but I find it so interesting that when it comes to the discussion of race in America, we have yet really to, to fully grapple with it. To your point, we certainly have made progress, right? right. Um, we have elected Barack Obama and in many ways, I think you even mentioned this in one of your previous books, right? Like that election, I think in many ways, uh, many ways kind of pushed back this discussion of race and racism because folks were able to turn to the election of him as president. Right. Um, but yet uh, so much of, 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 of the toxicity and the racism that we experience in this country just goes unacknowledged, unaddressed. And then you have presidential candidates who water it down and say that that's not who we are. Let me agree with you. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I think, you know, I didn't know about the story in St. Charles. That's disturbing that this is still happening. Um, and the sad part about it is that black history is American history. They're, they're, they're inseparable. A lot of what has happened to almost everything that's happened to black people is a result of American history. Um, so you can't really talk about American history unless you talk about that. You can't talk about the fact that the Constitution itself describes black people as who were enslaved as only three fifths of a person. The U.S. Constitution, everybody venerates in the doors. This is a wonderful document that talks about this amazing sense of government, but it created an unjust system from the beginning. Even the Declaration of Independence that Nikki Haley was quoting, that she said that all men are created equal. Well, 
first of all, uh, it was not the case. All men were created equal. Uh, black people were not created equal. Women were not even included in that sentence, obviously. Um, and the indigenous people, the people who were native to this land, who were driven out of the land, they were attacked in that same document called savages. You know, so we, we have this tendency to want to whitewash our history. We want to pretend like, oh, we're all this, these pure, wonderful people, and you know, they might have made a few mistakes here and there, but they were, they had the right intentions all along. I did an interview the other day where I was talking to someone, uh, a white interviewer who was, who was who read the book and was surprised by a story about L. Frank Baum. Does anybody know who L. Frank Baum is? Some white person does. L. Frank Baum was the writer of The Wizard of Oz. And L. Frank Baum was a horrible racist, <laughs> notorious racist. And he wrote some of the most racist, vile, some of, some of it's in the book, some of the most racist, vile language you ever want to hear. Uh, and, and the stuff he wrote about Native Americans is even worse than what he thought about black people. He, he wrote that the, the indigenous Native American people are so disgusting that they deserve to be wiped out. He, he, he supported genocide, killing Native American people because he thought that they didn't deserve to, to live, that they needed to be to re be removed from this country so that good white people could take over and, and run it in a better way. And he became this legendary figure and his, his you know, book is turned into uh, the Wizard of Oz film, which everybody loves and adores. And I talk about that in the book because it's, I remember a few years ago when, um, I can't remember what the network was. So they, the, the network that does the, the live Broadway shows. NBC. NBC ran uh, The Wiz um, on TV. And I love The Wiz. It's one of my favorite musicals. I saw it back in the 70s, not in Broadway, but I saw it on you know, the movie version. And white people who did not like the idea of having NBC run this black themed version of The Wizard of Oz were livid about this. They were online complaining and yelling, what if we created a, a white version of, of The Wizard of Oz? How would they respond to that? <laughs> well, hello, The Wizard of Oz was a white film. No, everything in, everybody in there was white. I mean, they were green people, but you know, I mean, but everybody in there was white. There were no black people in The Wizard of Oz. And the person who wrote it was a, a vile, racist, and anti-Semite, and genocidal, uh, enthusiasts for killing Native American people. So it's just amazing how we we completely forget history and we pretend like, oh well, these black people are asking for so much. How dare they do this? We're thinking, not even ignoring, not even acknowledging the fact that white America was built on all these things for hundreds of years. So one of the things I did with the book, which um, I wasn't sure I was going to do it at first, but I decided to do it anyways. I put a chronology in the beginning. So the book starts. It's, I think it's like 10 pages. It's just a list of dates mm -hmm. from 1526 to 2023 of different things that happened. Uh, from the, I started 1526 because that was one of the first known slave rebellions that took place in South Carolina. And that, interestingly enough, was uh, almost 100 years before the 1619 that we know of when black people arrived uh, as slaves in Virginia. So this was in South Carolina, but it doesn't get acknowledged as much. But there was an uprising of black slaves in the United States 500 years ago. 500 years ago. That's how long this has been going on. And so people say, well, you know, we passed a civil rights law in 1964. Why are you still complaining? As if 50 or 60 years of a law that is easily violated and widely ignored could erase 450 years of history of racial discrimination against black people. It's just an astounding thing to say. So yeah, that's the reason why I put this chronology in there so everybody would be on the same page. And the book is written in a way so that it answers those 25 arguments that you that you mentioned before, but it doesn't it doesn't require you to read from cover to cover. Like you can skip around and read from you can read about crime, you can read about uh, schools, you can read about um, you know, black families, whatever it is that you're interested in, you can just sort of read about that topic. And, and I, I, I did that because I wanted to make it a user-friendly manual for people, not something you have to feel like you have to study and, you know, go from point to point, but you can just sort of pull it out whenever you need it and say, you know, you just said something and this is why this is not right. And I have it right here. So I like that format you have in which you uh, pose an argument and then you provide an answer. Right. And you just mentioned, you know, black on black crime.
crime. And that was a, a part in here in which, you know, you talk about it uh, is an outdated media trope. And you talk about uh, your uncle here in St. Louis, who up in North St. Louis was actually murdered. Yeah. And you talk about the fact that um, the police have not, you know, had not solved that crime. And in many ways, police seem to not yeah, get committed to working to solve crimes. And you even, there's this piece in here you talk about in, um, there's in, in LA, the uh, in a, NHI, yeah. no humans involved. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that and then share something about uh, your uncle and, and that story? Sure. Uh, yeah, NHI is a term that was used by police officers and law enforcement officials, I think starting in the 1970s. I can't remember. Uh, the, the funny thing is, I haven't read this book since like last year. Actually, that's not true. I read it in, um, in November. Last time I read it was in November because I had to do the audio version of it. I, I, I was listening to the audio version, by the way, too, which you know, is also great. So buy it here, but then buy the other version. <laughs> but I was listening to the audio version the other day. I was like, wow, I like this version. This is cool. <laughs> um, and I normally don't like my speaking voice, but it's it's kind of funny because it, it's, it, it, it was interesting for me. It was entertaining for me to, to, to listen to it because I was engaged like somebody else was reading this, you know, but it was it was fun. Uh, but anyway, um, so this whole this whole thing about black and black crime, this this story of NHI comes up from the seventies. The law enforcement officials are using this term "no human involved" because when a black person is involved in a crime with another black person, that's what the, that was the code that they used to describe it. NHI. So they didn't have to take it as seriously as another crime. Uh, and so it's, it's fascinating when people use this term uh, "black on black crime" today because the reality is that. Almost all crime is intraracial, not interracial. That means black people are, are far more likely to be killed, murdered, raped, robbed by other black people. But white people are also far more likely to be killed, raped, robbed, murdered by other white people. Almost all crime happens within their own people's own racial communities. And the reason why that happens so much in this, in this country is because we live in a segregated country still. You know, so obviously people aren't going to drive all the way up into another neighborhood to, 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 to commit crime in that neighborhood. I mean, sometimes you do because, you know, the robberies is one of the, right. burglaries is one of the classic examples where people do do that. Mm -hmm. but for the most part, that's not the way crime happens in our country. And people don't really acknowledge that. So, yeah, I, I would like to maybe read a little, a little part from the story. Yeah. Um, and it's your book. It's, it's a, it's a tip, different, it was, this was the hardest part of the book to write. This chapter I'm about to read right now, this section I'm going to read right now. And my cousin Rochelle is here, and she knows this history too. So I don't know how comfortable she is here when we talk about it too, because it was a, it was a difficult experience for me to, to deal with. I was a kid when this happened. Um, and so I never really understood what happened. And I went back and I went, I went back a couple of years ago and I did some research in the local newspaper archives uh, here in St. Louis, and I digged up the art, dug up the articles. Of what happened, and it was very gruesome. So, uh, so a spoiler alert and warning: if you're not ready for something gruesome, I'm about to read something that's unpleasant. Uh, starting, if you want to join me, it's on page 149. And I wasn't planning on how to read and hold up this book at the same time, but we figured this out. So, uh, put this here. All right, here we go. All right, it starts out. Uh, this is a chapter called "Black on Black Crime." Is an outdated argument. Uh, outdated media trope. And it, as you can see, each chapter starts with an argument and answer, um, which I did on purpose because I wanted you to have sort of a quick, easy, easy answer as opposed to having to read the whole chapter if you don't have time to do that. But this is a story. It was well past midnight on a Saturday when a burglar alarm rang inside a two story brick home in St. Louis, Missouri. The homeowner was in distress. Police were dispatched to, dispatched to an address in the 3000 block of Vine Grove in the North St. Louis community known as The Bill. What they discovered was a grisly scene. The officers found the owner, a 34-year-old black man, in a doorway. His unclothed body slumped near the burglar alarm button. The man's throat had been slashed, and he had been shot twice in the head and once in the left arm. He was transported to City Hospital, six miles away on Lafayette Avenue, where he was pronounced dead a few hours later. 
The victim was identified as Michael Holmes, and I knew him. He was my uncle. Turn the page here. The murder of my uncle took place in May 1980 when I was 14 years old. As far as I know, no one was ever arrested or charged in connection with his murder, and the mystery of his death still bothers me today. The police don't solve as many crimes as I once believed from watching old episodes of Columbo, and part of it may have to do with geography. There are certain neighborhoods where the police just don't solve murders, crime analyst Jeff Asher told The Atlantic's Derek Thompson in 2022. In New Orleans, 90% of murders in the French Quarter are going to be solved, said Asher, a former analyst with the New Orleans Police Department. A mile away in the Seventh Ward, maybe 15% of those cases are being solved. Meanwhile, black people are being disproportionately killed in America. Although we account for just over 13% of the US population, we make up nearly half of all homicide victims. Many of these victims, like my uncle, have long been considered disposable by the criminal justice system that is supposed to protect them. Most often, their killers are black. So I just wanna stop there. And I use this discussion as a point to talk about black on black crime. And the, what I do here is I respond to the argument that black people are, need to stop spending our time focused on police brutality and racism. We need to take care of the crime in our own communities. And what I do is I go through methodically over the course of the past decade, actually even more than a decade, but I go more specifically in the past decade, of example after example after example of black people in black communities and black neighborhoods who have been fighting against crime in our communities leading marches against crime in our communities leading effort to stop the violence i go i remember even when i was back in the day when jesse jackson in the 1980s was, was telling black people you know we need to put down the guns and stop the violence i remember hip-hop artists and rap artists were, were preaching that same message in the 80s and 90s and this whole myth that black people don't care about crime in our own communities that we've been we don't do anything about it we, we're only focused on racism is a lie we have been focused on it, but the reality is that many of our communities have been devastated because we don't have the resources those resources left our community now another chapter talks about that also about st louis those resources left our community during white flight and went to the suburbs they, they took the, the money and the dollars that was had been invested in the cities and they they, they stripped it from cities like st louis and detroit and philadelphia and put it into the suburbs where mostly white people were living they built highways with federal government dollars that went through once black neighborhoods they built these highways so they could create an easy passageway for white people to go to work in the city and then go back to their homes in the suburbs. Uh, and, and they also facilitated the opportunity for, for white people who were living in the city to escape into the suburbs and not have to deal with the crime that they, they were fleeing, but they were depriving black people of the people who lived in those in the cities of the resources to be able to, to fight the crime without the tax base without the debt the dollars from the federal government and the state and local government resources uh that's how you're able to, to be able to do that plus you need to have a steady stable job base where people have employment and they have health care and good schools and all those things that they weren't investing in the in black communities so it's it's a it's a it's a it's a tricky logic, as, as Malcolm X would say, how you can take somebody's resources and then, and then blame them for, for not succeeding after those resources have been stripped away from them. It's interesting you talk about the highways. I think also here in St. Louis, in, in our part of our history, Highway 70, right, running west, went through a black cemetery. Mm -hmm. I have family members who are buried in that cemetery. Yes. And I remember when I went to... There's another story. I'm going to write another book at some point. I haven't, I haven't figured out how, how this is going to happen. I'm going to write another book about my family because I, um, I'm a very unusual family. And I, I only met my biological father um, eight years ago. Um, and um, yeah, I. As a result of meeting my biological father, I started on this whole journey to find out about my family history. One of the things I discovered is that Boykin is not my name. 
Uh, but I, I, you know, this is my name now, so I haven't changed it. But, uh, but when I say that, I mean, I got that name from my adoptive father, William Boykin. Um, but that was not his real name either. Um, he, he didn't know that at the time when he when he lived. I discovered that after he passed away. But all those are secrets are going to discover it to reveal in the book. But um, but yeah, that I, it, it was a, it was a, it was a story that that took me to back to St. Louis to, to explore my family history. And I went to that cemetery, and I remember looking. Uh, there's one side is over by the uh, the airport. The other side is at, uh, on the other side of what is it, seventy? And and it was just shocking because some of my family members um, had been buried there and then then returned to another place. In fact, my grandmother, um, who is uh, uh, I don't know. Do you remember Rochelle? What, what hospital? I mean, what um, cemetery? Uh, uh, Magnolia Burial. Uh, is it Washington, Washington Washington Park or something like that? I can't remember the name of the cemetery right now. But my grandmother is at a cemetery now with several other uh, of our family members are right next to her. And some of those family members, um, including her her husband who died in 1965, were buried in that in that other uh, other cemetery and had to be reinterred into a new cemetery. It's interesting. It, it's it's the level of disrespect at times, right? Yeah. Um, for the sake of progress. You know, we also see it in other cities, you know, which, as you said, you know, these highways go through and split complete neighborhoods. Um, uh, black cities struggle because of decisions by white policymakers. Um, this is a perfect example of that. And, and again, you raise that argument of a lot of people are looking at what's happening in these uh, Democrat run cities. And they're disgusted. That's Donald Trump in September 1 of 2020. What page are you on? I don't know where you're on. I'm on uh, 165. Okay, 165. All right. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to read a little perfect okay. Can I? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, this is also about St. Louis. I'm glad you picked that one out, too. Um, this is a page 165, chapter 19. The address printed on the death certificate from my maternal grandfather is 3012 Vine Grove in St. Louis, Missouri. It's the same address where his son would later be murdered. It's also the address on my birth certificate. Michael C. Holmes was a janitor who moved from Tennessee to Missouri during the era of the Great Migration. He settled in the Ville area of St. Louis and bought a home near the corner of Vine Grove and Labadee. A draft card from World War I shows his family members living in the house as early as 1917, one year after St. Louis voters approved a ballot measure prohibiting black people from moving into any block with 75% white residents. When the US Supreme Court struck down the racist housing law in St. Louis and other cities in 1917, white residents found clever new ways to ban black people from their neighborhoods. They relied on private contracts known as racially restrictive co covenants, which oblige white property owners not to sell their homes to potential black buyers. In the next decade, the black population in the Ville neighborhood swelled from 8% in 1920 to 86% in 1930, as the refugees of the Great Migration from the South settled in the area. The proud black community with its own high school and hospital produced legends, including rock star Chuck Berry and world heavyweight boxing champion Sonny Liston. Three decades after my grandfather settled into his home, racially restrictive covenants were still being used in St. Louis to block black families from living where they wanted. One of those families was the Shelleys, J.D. Shelley, his wife Ethel Lee Shelley, and their children. On September 11, 1945, they moved into a home at 4600 Labadee Avenue, just three blocks from my grandfather's house. The young black couple paid $5,700 for the modest two-story brick house and planned to continue renting out the top floor to a white tenant. But the same day they moved in, they were served with court papers demanding that they move out. So I talked about that story earlier, uh, the Shelley case, but uh, this chapter actually goes beyond that and goes into the ways in which uh, black cities are sabotaged by 
white state legislators. Um, and what I mean is that there's this doctrine this, uh, in, in uh, law and politics called preemption. And what that means is that state lawmakers um, get to decide what cities can do. So if the city of St. Louis passes a law banning handguns or requiring masks during COVID or um, a, a law to require people to recycle or something like that, anything they might want to do, the state can come in and say, nope, can't do that. We don't like it. And the problem is the state legislators tend to be different from people who live in the city. The state legislators are overwhelmingly white, rural, and Republican. And the people who live in the city tend to be people of color, uh, women, immigrants, uh, people who are more open-minded and progressive and inclusive. And their voices get erased. So people blame these cities, a lot of the cities that are struggling. Why can't these cities lift themselves up and do something and fix themselves? Well, because anytime they try to do something, the states get to overrule them. We're seeing this in Mississippi. We saw it. We we're seeing it in, in, in states in the South and, and other places. But one of the best examples is is um, the Brett Favre, the former NFL football uh, quarterback, who received millions of dollars uh, from the state of Mississippi to build a volleyball facility for his daughter uh, at his daughter's school. Welfare funds that were directed to it so he could get build welfare funds to, for his daughter. Uh, and he's a millionaire, like he needs the money, right? Uh, and at the same time, the state of Mississippi was denying resources to black people in black communities. Even in the state of Jackson, where in the city of Jackson, where they were, where the, where the pipes were, were old and, and needed to be replaced, were they having water issues. And it was a health threat to the people in the mostly black city in this community, in the state of, state of Mississippi. They tried to raise funds through a tax revenue, uh, a tax bond issue, in order to get the, the, the money they needed to replace their old pipes. They did so, the city voters approved it, and the state legislature said, no, you can't do it. I mean, you know, people wonder why the cities are struggling, because anytime that the local government try to do something to help people in their communities, the white Republican conservative legislatures at the state level decide, no, we're not going to let you do that. And then they want to blame those cities for not, not lifting themselves up. Then that's problematic. That this, this is a part of this whole gaslighting that's going on in our country where people are, are people are afraid to acknowledge the reality of racism, but then they want they want to blame people who are the victims of that for not lifting themselves up from the problems that they were they didn't create themselves. And and, and the resources then, right, are <laughs> allocated in such ways that prevent those who are in most need of them to to help right and, and and those who who live and sit far away are then able to make those decisions to to, to the impact well yeah and in fact one of the best examples i can always think i can think of is, is prisons you know most prisons are not located in, in inner cities they're located far away in, in small rural neighborhoods i mean in distant rural neighborhoods um and the advantage for those rural neighborhoods is that they get tax revenue for that, and they get jobs so that they have to have people who work in those prisons, and and um, and the, the people who are working in those prisons, the people who are benefiting from that, are mostly white, and the people who are being incarcerated are mostly black and brown, and it also makes it harder for the families who are being disrupted. If you have a, a family member who is incarcerated and they're sent off to some place hundreds of miles away in your own state, you can't easily visit them. Um, it disrupts that connection between your family, and it, and it, and it deprives uh, the, the resources that would could be directed to the neighborhoods where those people actually come from, uh, but instead puts it in some faraway community, which gets the benefit from it. So there's just, there's just there's so many different levels in which this system has been constructed. It, 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 when you start to pull it all apart, it's, it's just baffling. There's, a, there's a, a quiz I do at the end of the book, in chapter 25, where I ask people to um, do a Google search. And I, I encourage people to do this. You know, you can do it on your own time whenever you want. But it's really simple. Think of something you're interested in, whatever topic you might be interested in, the issue you might be interested in. It could be dog walking. It could be um, 
race car driving. It could be computer science. It could be uh, uh, the, the, the artificial intelligence. Well, anything you're interested in, just throwing out random things that are coming to my mind. And then go on Google and do a search for the history of racism in that subject. And look at what pops up. I did that for days and days when I was doing research for this book. And I, there's not a subject you can think of where you, you put that information in there, the history of racism in such and such a subject, and you won't find something that just stuns and astounds you. That racism has pervaded every element of our society. I mean, it's just so 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 inclusive and, and so broad. I mean, the, the law school I attended, the same law school Barack Obama attended, uh, is was founded, not founded, but was was funded from the sale of, of enslaved black people. You know, the bank where I bank, uh, it, 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 it was funded by the sale of enslaved black people. Uh, the, the, the whole history of our country was built on, in many ways, the, the, the uncompensated labor of African-American people. And, and that is a part of the history, even the 20th century and 21st century history, which we think, oh, well, that's probably not going to be affected by slavery. Well, there's still a legacy of slavery. And then there is also a legacy of segregation. I was in uh, uh, Richmond, Texas, a few weeks, no, a few months ago. Uh, uh, my mom lives in, in, in Texas, in, outside of Houston. And I was in Richmond, Texas at a, uh, a school where they discovered when they were digging up the school, uh, digging up to build this new school, they discovered 99 unmarked graves that belonged to black people who had been imprisoned at this place called the Imperial Prison uh, Camp and outside of um, outside of Houston. And it was a, a, a facility that was built as part of the Imperial Sugar Company, which was back in the 1900s, early 1900s, something like that. Um, and it came out of this policy uh, where what they would do is after slavery ended, they still needed cheap labor. Uh, they couldn't get free labor, so they found a way that they could get really close to, to free labor. They incarcerated black people for petty crimes, like, like today. Like today. <laughs> like today. But they incarcerated black people for petty crimes. So the, so the purpose of putting them back on the same plantations where they worked. So they would arrest you for like walking on the railroad tracks or um, loitering in the streets. Um, uh, you know, just minor in, in minor violations right. of, uh, yeah, or, or jaywalking or things like that. Arrest, they were specifically targeted to, to, uh, to get black people, lock them up in prison, and then sell those black people to the same plantations where they had worked before. It's called convict leasing, convict leasing. And it's just so cynical. The, 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 the systems and mechanisms that have been made that have been made over time and they've evolved to sort of incorporate different ways. I think I've talked a lot. Maybe we should take some questions. Uh, I don't know if that's where, where we have a time period. Yeah, we've got 15 minutes left yeah. or so, so. That's good, okay. Okay, yeah. And Evan, are you monitoring? I, I saw yes. Evan lingering oh, over that, so <laughs> maybe it's time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'll keep an eye here for all of Are there any questions here in person? I'm going to talk to you, Heather. I'll let you continue talking, but I, just, I don't want to be, not give people the opportunity to ask a question if you have any. And Evan, you're okay on that. Yes, I'll keep an eye on that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's, um, of the arguments in, 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 uh, that, that you present of the 25, what are your two top um, arguments that you are faced with most or that you found to be uh, most uh, problematic? Um, why don't I just do this? I don't really know the answer to that question, but why not, <laughs> I'm going to think about it as I read through. Why don't I just read through quickly the 25 chapter, chapter title? Mm -hmm. It should only take like a minute or so. Uh, the first one is, is Chapter one, Barack Obama's election does not compensate for hundreds of years of racism. The response, the response to people said, oh, we gave you Obama, what else do you need? You know, the racism is over. Chapter two, critical race theory is not indoctrinating school kids to be woke. 
this is annoying to me because I actually studied critical race theory when I was in um, in law school, and it's not something it's that's not. taught in high school. Yeah, so, right. so yeah. or, or even the way in which it's being presented is not the way in which she Crenshaw yeah exactly presented it. You know, it, it's who a, coined it, the phrase. It is people are really upset about history. That's what they, they don't want a real true history being taught, so they call it critical race theory. Number three, Dr. King did not say that America should be colorblind. Because people are always quoting that one line from Dr. King every year. I believe that, I hope that I, I, well, my children one day live with, with, one day live in the world where they're judged by the color, not by the color, there's going to be content their character. I, I've heard it so many times it gets confused, confused in saying it. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I should be using my microphone too. Um, then um, the next one is Republicans are no longer the party of Lincoln. You know, they, all these people were talking about Republicans being the party of Lincoln because Lincoln was Republican, but that party died. And, and now they're now they're ce dying. Now they're celebrating Confederates, the same Confederates that Lincoln fought against. Uh, the next one: the Civil War was about slavery, not states' rights. I had no idea that was going to come up re recently. Nikki Haley just said this a few days, a few weeks ago. Here in 2024, people were. It's 160 years ago they fought this war. <laughs> Uh, number chapter six, Black History Month is still needed in the society that denies black contributions. That's the response of people who are saying, well, why do we have to have a black history month? Those kinds of stuff. So, same people say, why do you have black entertainment TV? Why do you have historically black colleges? Because yes. we couldn't attend black, we couldn't attend white colleges. We couldn't have white people on your television networks. We our history wasn't taught. So of course that's the reason I was included. I just saw an interview uh, with Jasmine Guy. Uh, she just won her first Emmy, and, and I think we all recall Jasmine Guy from um, uh, Different World, Different World uh, the, the Cosby spinoff. And she said that during you know the late 80s, uh, early 90s, in which that show ran, that uh, black college HBCU enrollments like tripled mm -hmm. because we saw ourselves in television going to school in black college. Absolutely. Yeah. It's important. Visibility is critically important. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do more quickly here to get to the rest of them. Uh, chapter seven: Affirmative action is not reverse discrimination. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, that's just. That's, you have to read how much it to get that one. Uh, but that's actually a personal story I tell about that too. Chapter eight: Even the poorest white people have white privilege. There's this, this tendency from some. I hear a lot of white people say, "Well, I'm poor. I don't have white privilege." You know, and Oprah's got Oprah's got a billion dollars, and Beyonce is rich, and Jay Z is rich. Yeah, they have economic privilege. They don't have racial no, privilege. Racial. Those are two different things. People forget about. Uh, number nine: Yes, European immigrants struggled, but they were not slaves. That's important because a lot of people say, "Oh." White people were treated badly, and we we pulled ourselves up from bootstrap. Uh, chapter ten: White Americans still benefit from the legacy of slavery. There's a tendency to pretend like, oh, it's over. That was hundreds of years ago. Why don't we just move on? Meanwhile, they can't even move on from the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> chapter eleven: Being called a Karen is not comparable to being called the N word. This is actually kind of a joke chapter. Uh, I wasn't sure that was a serious argument. But I heard people say that, you know, like. This is offensive. You're calling me a Karen. That's like, I mean, like, that's not the same as the N word. No, yeah, I mean, like, there's there's nothing equivalent to the N word in, in the English language, you know. So, um, number twelve, complying with the police does not protect us. That's annoying. We hear that, but we heard that about Michael Brown. We heard about Tra Trayvon Martin, even though it wasn't the police, but it was a private citizen. But we hear about it all the time. Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland. If you just comply, then you won't die. Even when we do comply, we die. Right. Uh, chapter 13, no, we're not going back to Africa. Donald Trump made this argument a few years ago that people should go back to Africa. They want to complain about what's going on in the country. And black people should go back to Africa, which is an outrageous thing to say. Chapter 14, black people don't have to prove our patriotism. This is a response to the whole attack on Colin, Colin Kaepernick and other people. It's like, oh, you have to, you, you should be thankful for whatever, everything America has done for you. And you, and you should not be kneeling on the knee. You should be standing up and, and thanking God that you're living in this great country. And part of the greatness of living in this country is your ability to, to, st to, to and get on your knee and protest. Right, exactly. Right. That's what Dr. King said. Exactly. Chapter 15. This is actually the longest chapter in the book. We will never reach equality without reparations. And I'm not gonna really get into that right now, but just say, you know, if you want to have a, if you want to have a real deep discussion about reparations, this is a good starting place to to, to to begin. Chapter 16: There are more white people than black people in welfare, which is it? 
you know, I think anybody who knows anything about about the demographics of America, this should be obvious because yes, there's there's like more white people than black people. Right. Right? Like, <laughs> we're only thirteen percent of the population. Do you right. think that we're like the fifty percent of the people of welfare? Is that when people think of welfare, they only think of black people. They right. don't want to realize that there's a lot of poor white people who are on welfare, mm -hmm. and they don't want to acknowledge that. Number 17, black on black crime is an outdated media trope. We talked about that earlier. Number 18, black families are not broken. That's a that's a good one because people always say that you know if you just deal with what's wrong with the black family, you wouldn't have any have so many problems. And I use this chapter to talk about all the black families where people are doing all those things right that people expect them to do to, to go to church and, and follow the law and everything else. And they're still discriminated against, still suffer, still violated in, in the law and still uh, have their rights taken away from them. For the ways in which systemically our government was set up to, in many ways, you know, separate the black family. Right. And so, you know, one slavery, point, that's slavery no point. Yeah. for sure, you know, but then take it even, you know, to, to some of the welfare policies and practices. Right. And so that is, you know, a, a, a household had evidence of a man living in it, then they did not receive funding. funding. Right. Yeah. yeah there, there's so many different ways, nefarious ways in which government has, con has constructed uh, laws and policies to make our families vulnerable, uh, right. to attack our families, assault our families. Mm -hmm. And so it's a miracle that our families still exist after everything has happened. Um, but chapter 19, black cities struggle because of decisions by white policymakers, we talked about that. Chapter 20, there is no race card. I'm so sick of hearing people say, stop playing the race card. Oh my God. <laughs> chapter 21, black friends do not immunize people from racism. This is a response to people who are saying, well, you know, I don't have black friends. You know. Somebody actually said this recently about Donald Trump. They said, uh, Donald Trump had, Donald Trump has a black girlfriend. He dated a black black woman. Joe Biden never dated a black woman. You know, oh, wow. like, what? Is that the test for being, uh, for not being not racist? Being racist. That, that you date somebody who, who's of a different race? Uh, and the weird part about that is that just look at American history, you know, the slave owners in slavers, they mm. raped black women. They um, had children with black women. Even recently, um, Strom Thurmond, the segregation senator from South Carolina, had a child with his black housekeeper. Um, and he didn't like black people. Um, whatever. And then let's see, um, chapter 22, people who say they don't have a racist burn in their body haven't searched hard enough. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a funny one. I hear people say that. Chapter 23, yes, you do see color and there's nothing wrong with that. And I just want to read real quickly that from 197. This is my favorite argument and answer. I didn't write this myself, but this was clever. I think it was Trevor and <coughs> uh, 197. Each chapter, as I said, begins with an argument that has an answer. So in chapter 23, you see um, Fox News commentator Tommy Laren was on The Daily Show in 2016. She said, I don't see color. And then Tom, and Trevor Noah responded, so what do you do with a traffic light? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I, just, I just love this idea because it's, it, it's so stupid. Though. Like, it doesn't really deserve a serious response. But it really, we all see color. There's nothing wrong with that. Chapter 24, all lives matter is a cheap excuse to avoid saying black lives matter. Mm -hmm. Nobody was saying all lives matter until people, black people started saying black lives matter. And they don't really believe that all lives matter because they clearly don't believe that about the, the immigrants who are coming to this country. They don't believe it about black people who are in this country. They don't believe it about anybody except for their own group of people, their own child of people. Education. Child care, early child care. Um, no, yeah, they they believe in protecting life when you know when you're in the in the in the womb. But the moment you're born, they don't you're on your own. They don't want to provide any sort of help or assistance for you. And then last but not least, chapter twenty five. Yes, everything is about race. And there you have it. That's the book so now I've saved you from reading. <laughs> but, but not from buying it. So I always think this to myself. Okay. This, this question from you all doesn't mean anything to anybody but me. Do you really think that we only made up 13% of this country? Mm. Um, I don't, you know, it's, I assume you think it's more than, and I, I don't really. It's way more than that because how can 13% of the country make you that ugly? Mm -hmm. How can 13% of the country pose a factor in anything? 
as far as wow. voting anything. How's that even change any spectrum? It could 13%? No. So I believe that number is very skewed. You know, it's, 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 it's an interesting, interesting thing because I, I want to say this because it's like a part of the reason why um, white people are so upset with with black power and the reason we have these movements, this pendulum swing, whenever there's a black advance, you know, when we have reconstruction in the, in the 1860s or you have the civil rights movement or you like Barack Obama, there's some sort of pushback to the other side. Part of the reason why they're upset is because there are some places where they are really afraid of being outnumbered. And one of those places is in the South. I mean, if you look at places like Mississippi and South Carolina um, and Alabama and Georgia, you see there's a huge black population in a lot of those places. It's not as much up north and it's significant in places like here in, 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 the, in the city of St. Louis and, and Chicago and places like that. But there's a lot of places where there's not a lot of black people at all. Like, you know, I've been to 48 and 50 states and never been to Alaska, Hawaii. But I have been to, I've been to Minot, North Dakota, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Ain't no black people. I'm the other people. Ain't no black people. But, but the, sad, the sad part about it is that the, even though those small states, which are overwhelmingly white, have disproportionate influence on our government because they each get two state senators. Even though, like, that's a tiny state of Wyoming, which has like 600,000 people in it, they have two, and it's like 90% white. They have two U.S. senators, the same number of senators I have in my state of California, which has 40 million people in it. That's just, and my state is far more diverse. That's just totally not fair. You know, I think it's an interesting question. You think in terms of census, right? Like, that's yeah. how we get that. Yeah, right, yeah. through census, and it's a question, I guess, who's taking census? Are, 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 are we being counted? Are we being reported? Are we, are we, are we, are we showing up? Are we actually going to say? I don't think so, because we, in our minds, we have all these different uh, identities, the ways in which we, identities, but also, what are you taking from me if I do fill this out? Yeah. What, was, what, what's going to happen with this if I do fill this out? So I think all of those things result from our slavery, the history of everything that has gone on in this country. So I don't think, I think the number is skewed because yeah, we're not going to say, uh, yeah, this many people are in my house. And I know, I mean, even when they did it a few years back, I forgot how many years ago they had filling out. I don't think a lot of people did. I, I think a lot of, well, a lot of black people did not fill it out. They didn't fill it out. Like, that's I interesting. I never thought of that, but it because I, 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 I just I, can't I, see how we're making that big of a polls on some a country if we're only thirteen percent. But see, I can see, I can see how we can make. We can. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of communities that don't they don't make up a large population, but still have a, a lot of influence. I mean, Native Americans, Indigenous people. I mean, originally they were the majority of the population, but then they were wiped out. But like now it's a fraction of the population. And for hundreds of years, white people were obsessed with, with, with Indians. You know, They were obsessed with demonizing them and vilifying them so they could justify the genocide against them. Um, so there are some states in the South, in particular in the 1800s, where the black population got larger than the white population and that's when they tried to drive them out in fact in one instance in Wilmington North Carolina there was a uh a, was it Wilmington? I think it was Wilmington yeah uh there was a a, a, a multiracial government elected uh and for the first time I think in 1898 and the white people who lived in that neighborhood in that community were so upset that they burned down the government buildings and drove out all the people who were part of that multiracial government and reestablished white control. I mean, that's just stunning. Like the fear of black people is so pervasive in white society because of the way that we came here and the sense of the fear, the fear that we're gonna uh, seek some sort of retribution against them. That um, I could easily see, even if it was just one percent of the population, that a lot of white people would be really, really, really upset by this, and that, that's a sad thing. But uh, it doesn't really have to take a lot of people. Just one black person can be really threatening to to what to a lot of to a lot of white people. One black person taking a knee, Colin Kaepernick, the president of the United States, had jump had to jump in and attack him for 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 years. 
He said he needs to get the hell out of the, off the field and be fired from his job. Just because he decided to take a knee. Boogeyman doesn't What's exist. What's so threatening about coming to that? That's just a boogeyman doesn't exist, and we are very, you know, at times. Well, really that, that's true, too. Afraid. Yeah, that's true, too. Yeah. That's a, that's a great, great question. Yeah. Right there, so. I, yeah, I have one more too about reparations. Oh, okay, all right. So, um, I I feel very passionate about passionate about that. Not so much about the money compensation, but it is about the money compensation because everybody in this country who was supposedly treated bad, like every ethnicity, pretty much, has been compensated somehow. Even the Indians, they have been compensated somehow. Europeans, everybody, Jews, everybody has been compensated somehow. But you told black people way back when, we're going to give you 40 acres in a mule. We didn't even get that. We well, did not get that either. Well, so this, you, you, you got told, nothing. There's a whole chapter in this, in the first about this. And it's interesting, I'm just going to say two quick points about this. First, Black people did get 40 acres in mule. A few. Lot, thousands, tens and thousands of black people got 40. This is the point we don't realize that. Tens of thousands of black people got 40 acres in mule. After after um, the, the General Sherman issued the field order, number 15, uh, in 1865, toward the end of the Civil War, he led this march to the sea from Atlanta to Savannah and, and burned all the, these white homes and white businesses, and they were pissed off. And uh, he got to the, the end of his his his, uh, his journey in, in Savannah, and he issued this declaration guaranteeing black people would get 40 acres of land for each family, and he and later promised that they'd also get mules to till the land. They lived on this land. This black people actually received this land. This was in this happened in the spring of 1865, and it stopped though. In the fall of 1865, after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, his, his successor was a president named Andrew Johnson from Tennessee, who was opposed to everything that Abraham Lincoln had been fighting for, and he rescinded the order. So he took he evicted those black people who had already been tens of thousands of black people were actually living on this land. And they evicted them and gave it back to the white people. So yeah, but that we never, they, 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 you, know, you know, a lot of times white people use this, this language Indian giver, which is an offensive term because they take, took the land from the Native American people. But Indian giver is a term that can be used for what what just what just happened to the black people who were given the land uh, in the 1860s and then, and then the land was taken from them. Then the second point I just want to make about this is that after. Abraham Lincoln signed a bill in 1863, it was called the Emancipated Constipation, Emancipated, uh, what's the, uh, Emancipation Pro- Pro- no, no, not the Emancipation Proclamation, it's, it, there was a bill, uh, it was a Con- Compensated Emancipation Act of 1863, that's what it was, the Compensated Emancipation Act, it freed black people who were slaves in uh, the District of Columbia. It's an important piece of legislation. Almost nobody knows about it, talks about it. And the reason why it's significant is because in order to, to free people who were who were enslaved, they had to do something in order to comply with the Constitution. You know, over here at the U.S. court, at the, the state courthouse here um, in, in, uh, in the city courthouse where the Dred Scott decision was decided in 1857, the Supreme Court decided that the, the, the Supreme Court decided in the 1857 case, Dred Scott, that you can't take slaves away from white people as you compensate them because it violates the Fifth, the fifth Amendment uh, uh, compensation clause that you can't take private property without compensation. So when they freed the black people, they provided reparations to the white slave owners. Yeah. They asked, they didn't give any, they didn't give you money for the black people to be for the, for the taking of your own property and your and your possession, your your being, but they actually provided reparations to black to the white enslavers. This is fascinating, and, and, and we say, oh, we can't provide reparations. That, that's going to cost too much money. So I, I this this chapter is is the longest chapter in the book because it has it goes through every one of those little arguments that people make about why we can't do it and it explains why we there's. I am, I'm not at all confident America is about to do this, by the way, especially considering that we're actually passing laws right now, and, and, and we have judges in place 
uh, from the Trump administration who were making it illegal to do anything to help black people. You could, Joe Biden could even give money to black farmers who have been discriminated against. They said that was violating white people's rights. <laughs> they struck down affirmative action in, in colleges just last year. I mean, they're, they're going after DEI now. Um, anything that's diversity, equity, and inclusion, they're going to, they are systematically dismantling all of the racial progress in the past five or six decades and um, trying to reverse what happened to everything, uh, all the progress that happened for women as well in the past century. So ultimately, this is going to be a really challenging election we're facing in the next uh, few months because it's a question of whether we're going to move forward as a country or move backward to where we were in the past. And um, I'm not at all convinced we're going to have a, a good outcome for this. We're, it all depends on what people do. If we have to be engaged. I want to leave on a negative note. Too. Uh, we have to be engaged and, and active and, and fight for our rights. Yes. Is Clarence Thomas mentioned anywhere in your book, Campus, arguments? <laughs> Well, you know, um, I have to say, I'm not going to read anything about Clarence Thomas because I don't really want to, but uh, I'm, I'm, the reason why I pull out the book is because I did something with this book that I've never done. I've written seven books. It's the first book I have an index in. And I, I didn't really want to do an index, but index takes a lot of work to put together this thing. And um, I didn't have to do it. I just had to review it, you know, because I have a professional person who does it. But but he is in, he has mentioned the book I see here. I didn't know for sure where it was, but he's mentioned several times in the book. Um, on page 25, page 33, uh, for sure. Uh, but I don't remember why he was mentioned, but he's uh, he's definitely a figure who, um, along with maybe Tim Scott and some other people, <laughs> are just embarrassing, I think. You know? um, and and that, that's another point I just want to make, too, which is that there have always been black people who support white supremacy. Mm -hmm. You know, there there were um, there were there there were women who support sexism, who support um, the discrimination against women. There are Jews who support anti-Semitism. There are Native American people who support the, the mistreatment of, of the indigenous people. And I say this because it's important to acknowledge that you're never going to have 100 percent unanimity in any community. There's always going to be dissenting voices. But the overwhelming majority of people in these various communities support the liberation of their own people. And yet the people who don't believe in the liberation of their people are the ones who get elevated by the by the oppressors. They want you, they want you to focus on Clarence Thomas and Candace Owens and Tim Scott, because they don't want you to think about what the Al Sharptons and Jesse Jacksons and, and other people and uh, are, are saying. Are yeah. are saying right? <laughs> Keith, I'm looking over at Evan, and yeah, Evan we are, we are, yeah, yeah, we are at the right. time boundary. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us in person. So we're going to do.